Well, all I can say is today's guest on Amazing Greats is a ball of fire, an inspiration, and her story is nothing short of amazing. From a background that had no room for God to a life that is dedicated to knowing more and more about God. It started with a sports injury and her mom insisting on reading the Bible at her bedside. The life transformation that took place in those months is truly amazing. And her energy and enthusiasm in sharing that story is something I guarantee you're going to love. Without delay, let's get into our conversation with Gabby Viesca. She is coming to us live. I love this because with Zoom, we can talk anywhere in the world. And you are, at this very moment, you happen to be on vacation-ish in Mexico, correct? Correct. Monterrey, Mexico. Monterrey. All right. Um, and so let's do a little quick introduction so folks know who we're talking with today. Uh, you serve as the Director of Strategic Planning and Outreach at Portland Seminary. You're Assistant Campus Master, uh, Master, <laughs> Pastor, Master, Master Pastor. You, whatever. You can just call me back. That works. <laughs> uh, at George Fox University, which is great. You hold a master's degree in biblical studies and a bachelor's degree in international business. You were deeply involved in the world of international business, working as a junior consultant in the city of Puebla, uh, Mexico, providing business coaching and strategy to young entrepreneurs and also designed global business strategies for General Electric uh, that were implemented worldwide. Then there was a transition from the corporate world to the pastoral ministry world. And we're going to get into all of that here right now. But let's start with Gabby as a little girl in Mexico. So you were born and you were raised in Mexico. Yes. Let's start there. Did you have a Christian, you know, background there? Is, did it start for you there? Yes and no. Let me. So I was born and raised in a city called Torreon. Every time I mention that city, people just go, what? So no one knows where that is, but it's northern Mexico. And I, I have to say there was a whole lot of religious influence in my life just by the very fact that I was born in Mexico, which is a deeply Catholic country. Right. Any any party, any quinceañera, any Baptists and weddings, you are just part of, of a Catholic atmosphere. And the, the interesting thing with me is that I was not raised Catholic. Oh. So my dad was Catholic. My mom was uh, she grew up Methodist, which I always tell this joke. I feel like there are three Methodists in Mexico and my mom is one of them. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a 99 percent Catholic country. So it was a, an odd upbringing for me. But I was not raised Methodist either. And so it was this weird space in which I knew I didn't really belong somewhere religiously or spiritually. And so I always saw myself kind of from the outside. And there were some benefits to that. Uh, so the, the answer is like, no, I was not brought up a Christian really in my day to day practices. But I have a heavy Catholic influence just because I'm Mexican. So uh, where then along the line did um, that become a part of who you are? Where, where did you become acquainted with Jesus? And yeah. how did all that start? What was, is, was there a special aha Jesus moment? Uh, oh, there's a massive moment, Rick. You need to let me know, do I have five minutes, 50 seconds, three hours? You <laughs> tell me. <laughs> Let's go. Well, let's go with. Uh, let's go. Let's go with an hour. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. So there is definitely a massive moment, uh, and I'll just tell you really quick. Leading up to that, I was a, a a soccer player. I was a big time athlete. I played sports all my life. I played uh, soccer for the Mexican national team, actually, for the under sixteen. So just to give you a sense of how hardcore of an athlete I was. And I thought I had everything I needed. There was no need for God. I was, you know, starting games. And at some point in my athletic career, I got an injury. I was told I shouldn't play again. I was a goalie and I was pretty crazy goalie. I was just landing on my head, my back, my face. I didn't care. And so I ruined my back and I kept playing. I did not listen. I was super stubborn. Eventually graduated uh, international business, went to work for GE. I was uh, selected by, now I see it as by the grace of God. Back then it was all my merit, which is not what it was. 
because I was extremely young for this, the type of role that they were giving me, but I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. I was going to go to India to launch a big branch for GE. And right before that, I went to play soccer just to pick up game, even though I knew it was not supposed to. I dove in the air, landed, and my, my disc in my back kind of ruptured. I needed an emergency surgery. They told me I had to uh, rest for three to four months, but I had to be in India, you know, the following month. And for me, as an international business graduate, that was like a dream come true at age 24, right? To go and launch a branch for GE, the other side of the world. So I didn't listen. I, I went to see just all sorts of alternative medicine options. And I ended up through that getting a bone infection that left me laying on a bed for nine months without Oh my moving. gosh. Oh my gosh. Wow. Intense, Rick. This was intense, right? I was the kind of person that was always doing something, always on the go. And suddenly I'm in bed and I can't move. And that those nine months, which there's no way I could summarize that. Every time I share this story, new things, I remember different things. But I had to revisit everything I thought I wanted in life because I thought I was never going to walk again. And all I wanted in the past was to be famous and lots of money and, you know, to be recognized. And I was in that bed thinking, what do I want all those things for if I cannot even get out of my bed? And so my mom, she came to the hospital where I was staying and she being the, the devoted Christian that she was all, all her life, she started talking to me about God. And I was like, absolutely not. I do not want to hear anything about God. I, was like, I just had this big, there was a shield. But every morning, Rick, every morning, she asked me if she could read the Bible to me. And every morning I said, no. You can read the newspaper to me. You can read, you want to read to me? There's tons of great novels you can read to me. I was a very arrogant. Wow. Because she had, she had just gone to the hospital to take care of me 24 seven. Were you kind of, at this point, were you kind of blaming God for where you were at? I no, were I had, I, God to me was just an idea. In my head, only weak people needed an idea, an ideology to hold on to. God wasn't even like a, a person in my in my mind, right? Or a spirit or a being. It was an ideology. Um, and so, no, I wasn't blaming God at all. I wasn't aware of God anywhere in my life. And so one day, Rick, this was like one of the big moments. One day I was so tired, really, is the word, of her asking me the same question every morning that I said, you know what? Sure. Just so that she would stop asking me. And I said, sure, you can, you can read the Bible to me. And then, and then I said this to her, I said, but don't read, you know, there's some crazy stories in the Bible, especially in the old Testament. I had never opened the Bible, but I had heard things right about people, you know, killing other people. I'm like, don't, don't read those crazy stories to me. And she was so wise. And she said to me, fair enough. How about I read to you a book where they don't even mention the word God? And I said, bingo. Yes. <laughs> Do that. Yeah. Please. And so she read the book of Esther to me where the, the actual word God is all over the story, but the word God is nowhere to be found in that book. And the craziest thing happened, Rick. I mentioned she's was Methodist, so not a crazy charismatic denomination. This is important. I had zero experience with miracles, nothing. And as soon as she started reading the Bible, I was taking the highest doses of morphine at that time, and I was still in excruciating pain. But she started reading the Bible, and the pain went away. Ooh. And I was like, oh, no. I was grateful and shocked and annoyed and I did not want her to know. And I didn't tell her. <laughs> wow. Then, in my head, I thought, oh, she's going to think I'm going to fall for this Christian thing. And I'm never going to be a Christian. <laughs> so what I did, I just said to her, that is such a lovely story. Can you read it again? Just so that I wouldn't feel the pain. And now, as I look back at that moment, Rick, 
knowing that the word of God is alive and there is no way you can be exposed to it and not be transformed by it or touched by it. Every single day of Bible reading did something to me, of course. Wow. And so that's that's one moment. I can share so much more about me actually walking again, but we can stop for now. At what point did you get up and you were pain-free and, and uh, yes. walking and all that stuff? Yes. So you would think that after having such a crazy response, right? My, my first encounter with the Bible was a physical encounter just because I felt it in my body, right? It was obviously spiritual, but my response was physical. You would think that that's all I needed, right? To, to acknowledge the power of God, the presence of God. No, I needed way more. more From that proof. moment until I actually walked again, it was an ex at another, I don't know, three, four months in which I started reading the Bible for the first time at age, I, I don't know if I was 24 or 25, but around that age, very first time reading the Bible and slowly getting acquainted with this Jesus guy. And my and it was this slow process. At first, I just thought he was a cool guy. I thought if he were to be an influencer today, I'd follow him. I don't know about him being the, the son of God. That's a stretch, but I, it was slow progression. And then... Eventually, I got to the point where it was either making a decision or no decision whatsoever because I knew I was dying. So the infection that I had was slowly killing me, literally. And even though no doctor said this to my face, they said this to my parents. And I just knew it inside of me. There were a few nights when they told my parents, you should say goodnight to Gabby. She might not wake up tomorrow. Oh, like, this man. might be the last goodbye. They never told me that, but I knew, I knew it, Rick, deep inside. When you're that close to death, there's something that happens inside of you. And so I knew I was dying because at this point, it had been months of not moving. It took doctors months to figure out what was wrong with me. But they just said, we don't know what's wrong with her. We just know it's going to get worse. And it was already really bad. And so one day, I, I remember this prayer. This, in my opinion, is the most powerful prayer I've ever prayed. And the most powerful prayer I will ever pray, nothing will ever convert to this. And it's very simple, but I was in my bed knowing that I was gonna die. And I started talking to God, with God. There's a difference, to with, huh? And I said, you know what, God? I know that I'm on my way out. I, I feel it in my body. I feel it in my spirit. And I'm okay with that. Because at that point, I had been baptized. They had taken me out of the hospital bed to baptize me. It was awesome. It's very slowly because I couldn't move. So at that point, I was convinced that God was with me, that God was for me. And then there was a life with God after this physical life. So once I had made that shift in my head and in my soul, I was saying to God, I know on my way out, I have peace because I know where I'm going. However, <laughs> I'm only 25 years old. I said, if you give me a second chance, I'm going to spend every second of my life getting to know you, getting closer to you, talking to others about how wonderful you are. And that'll be my life. And I went to bed. Next morning, the passage that I was reading was the passage about having faith the size of a mustard seed. And remember, I'm reading this for the first time in my life. So I read that passage where Jesus is saying, all you need is faith the size of a mustard seed, and you can tell this mountain to move, and it'll move. And I thought, that is wild. And in Mexico, at least where I'm from, mustard seeds are not common. And so I didn't know if we were talking about an avocado seed or what kind of seed we were talking about. So I Googled size of a mustard seed because I didn't know. And I found out that it was this tiny little insignificant thing that you can hold with your thumbs. And I thought, oh, faith thy size, I've got. No more. But if that's all we need, because it says right here, I am good. So I told my mom, who was still in that hospital room with me, mom, I'm going to get up and walk. And she, she just said, Gabby, what are you talking about? I said, well, this book that you introduced me to says that all I need is, you know, faith the size of a mustard seed, and that's all I've got. 
And the worst that could happen is that I fall. You pick me up. And so they handed me a, a walker, you know, those that have the, the, the tennis balls at the bottom. You know, I called them walkers for old people. Because when you're 25, anyone above 40 is old. <laughs> now I'm almost there. And I'm so young. <laughs> so anyway, I asked them for one of those walkers for old people. And I, I, I finished my prayer from the night before. And it was just, in English, it's four words. In Spanish, it's three. That's why I need it think about it so i prayed this i said your will be done and it was a declaration that 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 assumed an acceptance of whatever the outcome was going to be for my life and that's why i call it a prayer because it was a, something was coming from my heart that was a mix between i i trust you i know who you are god i know that your will is powerful and ultimately it was god's will that i wanted for me and I was able to get up obviously because I mean you're not seeing me physically but you can see me moving on the screen I can walk <laughs> and, and and the nurses came running you know I was holding I was only holding myself with my with my arms on, the, on this walker and I tried to I dragged one foot and then I thought that is not walking that's a step I need another one so I dragged my other foot. And so that was walking. And then I fell because I was so excited. But eventually I walked again. And, and the nurses that knew me so well, they started screaming, like across the hallway, running, screaming, la niña que no puede caminar, camina, la niña que no puede caminar, camina, which means the girl that cannot walk is walking. And it was crazy. My was gosh. Crazy. Yes. What a great, great, great story. My goodness. And I'd, I'd kind of heard about the illness, but I'd, the details are what make this story so wonderful. It's, it's just great. So, so you got up and you walked. And then at that point, because you made that commitment, the declaration yes. that his will will be done, yeah. you changed your career path at that point? At that very point, Rick. And it was wild. It was radical. Because my, so GE that I worked for at that point, they were wonderful. They did not ask me for any medical reports to prove that I was in the, I mean, I was in a bed without moving. I could not make that up. But still, they kept paying me. They kept holding my job for me. They were fantastic. And then I show up almost a year later. And on the spot, I talk to my boss and I say, I cannot stay here. Like, actually, it was, I say on the spot, it was the first time I was seeing her, but it was two weeks. So I came back just for two weeks. And those two weeks, I went back home after work and I thought I, I made a promise. You know, I, my life was going to look different if I, if I'd stayed here because they didn't think I was going to make it, let alone walk. And so I went and talked to my, to my boss and she was, she was not pleased. She was not happy, but she's a good friend. And we, I actually saw her last month. I said, I cannot keep this job because I need to know who this God is that I barely know. And I continue to feel that way 10 years later, 12, 13, I don't know, 15 years later. I continue to feel that way. I barely know God. But especially, it was especially true back then. God gave me, me, not anyone else, someone like me who was a cheater, who was always in trouble, who thought was it, arrogant. Arrogant is crazy. And he gave me a second chance. Who is he? And so I quit right there in front of her. And I went on a 40 day retreat because I, in my, in my encounters with the Bible, I kept seeing 40 days, 40 days, 40 days. And I thought, I guess there's something special in 40 days. And there is, but I, I took 40 days. I went to a tiny little beach in Southern Mexico and I just read the Bible. And I served at a small little church there. And I was not going to come back unless I had either heard from God or made a commitment or knew what my next steps would be. And my next step was I need to go to school and I need to study the Bible left and right, up and down. I need to spend years studying this text and getting to know this God. And the only reason why I did that, I never saw myself in ministry was just to answer the question, who is this God that is so generous to me? 
That was the driving question. Boy, Gabby, this is just what a story. What an incredible story. So so you ended up getting a master's in theology. Yes. Um, and then um, and that at that point, you must have felt much more comfortable with the, what that book was all about. But yes, you know, no. <laughs> still don't have it mastered, right? With the Bible, which for me is a good thing. The Bible challenges me all the time. But yes, I was I, I was in love with that text. And more so than the text, because the text, the text is nothing unless you see that it's pointing you to God. Yeah. It's a text. So what, so what was next then? Where uh, did you end up uh, coming to the United States at that point? Or were oh, you, you were in the United States? My master's was in the United States. Okay, yes. yeah. And yeah, my yeah. plan was to go back to Mexico because I, I actually love my country so much. And my life in Mexico is a good life. And so we're, my family and I were just blessed to have a, a, a really good life uh, here in Mexico. And I never dreamt about going to the United States. And as I was approaching graduation, people were asking me what I was going to do. And I thought, I'm, I'm a businesswoman. I just, I had one question I needed to answer. I haven't answered it, but I'm okay going back to the business world. And they're like, you're not going into ministry? And I said, oh, no, that is not for me. And then they kept asking me. It's, it's at that time, you know, you hindsight is 2020. And it's awesome to look back and see how God just, intervenes in your in your journey right because the mm -hmm. hand of god is everywhere but at that time it looked like this for me i had my student visa which works as a work permit for one year when you're an international student i did not know that and the international student you know department people they they talked to me and they said gabby why don't you stay you have a work permit. People around the world would do anything to get a work permit for the United States. And I said, no, my life is pretty good in Mexico. I don't need to stay. And they kept insisting so much, Rick. At some point, I, I, was, I was a brat. I was a brat. But at some point, I had to start telling people not every Mexican person wants to move to the States, <laughs> which seems, seems to be what, what the idea is, what the expectation is. Yeah. Like, I love, I love living in Mexico, but after a while, you know, people telling me this is a great chance. You might as well explore it. And once you use the word explore with me, Rick, then I'm all in because then I think, oh, adventure for sure. And I started applying to jobs and the, the caveat to the work permit is that you can only use it if it's completely related to your degree. And my degree is in Bible, so my options were limited. Yeah. So I'm reaching out to all these churches thinking, oh, me at a church? There's no way. And I found this, you know, job for a women's pastor in the city of Portland, applied, and, you know, the rest is history. I ended up moving there. But I, I did not want that at all. In fact, when I went to my interview, I gave them five reasons why they should not hire me. <laughs> <laughs> and my interview <laughs> and, and i ended up staying there it was the it was the perfect team to meet with me and take those questions yeah <laughs> sorry so that, awesome. so that and so basically that's what you're doing today is um pastoring so yes and pastoring. no right now i actually j just finished at george fox so i was doing that the the director of the master's programs i just finished that role because I, I'm transitioning to doing more, for lack of a better term, freelance ministry. I love being in many different spaces um, and not just staying within one uh, specific church body. At least that's the season where I'm in right now, because I get to experience all the different flavors and languages and modes of experiencing God as a community. Yeah. And so, you know, this Sunday I'll be preaching somewhere else. And then next month I'll be preaching at another church. And I get to, yeah, to do, do church life with, with a lot of different communities. And it seems like such a natural for you because um, you can walk onto a stage and I've seen several of your videos uh, and you can, you can feel the love. You can yeah. feel, um, you know, comfort yeah. and you are um, immediately uh, a, 
a, a wonderful influence on this new group of people, right? And so your comfort level with that is obvious and <laughs> people are just attracted to you. My, the first time I saw you, well, our, our mutual friend, Scott, uh, introduced me to you uh, on video. And so I tuned in and took a look and he said, you're, you're going to love this gal because she's like, um, she is inspirational. She's energetic. She is just a ball of fire. And I said, oh, I got to check that out. Right. So <laughs> so I did. And you were. And it was amazing. So <clears throat> so that's kind of where. Uh, so. Are you accepting invitations uh, to? Yeah, I love. I preach all over the place. I love to as facilitate experiences for for churches for leaders. There's there's things I do like sessions that I call dreaming a spiritual practice. So sometimes we're I don't know if we're gonna talk about this or not, Rick. But sometimes we are so stuck in very specific ways of experiencing our faith that need to look like one thing or the other thing. When, when we are aware of God's presence all around us all the time, when we just change our posture, there's many other things that we can do and engage them as a spiritual practice too. So I do things like that. And yeah, I used to do radio a long time ago in Mexico. I miss that. So that's why when I got your invitation to this podcast, I thought, yes, it's kind of kind of similar <laughs> yeah yeah what kind of radio did you do was it like um was it as a guest. ministry always as a guest no this is long time ago back when oh. you know there was no room for god in my life even though oh, oh, oh. all so, around me <laughs> so you were a guest athlete kind of i mean that was kind of your identity at that point um right before athlete i was doing a lot of leadership you know speaking training i've done so many things rick you have for such a young lady. My wow. personality, I need, I, I get bored. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm committed. I'm committed to God. I won't get bored of that one. <laughs> so then you, you actually, you got married not all that long ago. What was about two years ago ish, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, how did that all happen? You met well, this man, and um, was he a Christian uh, follower? Or was he a Jesus follower himself? Yes. Yeah. In fact, his, his parents are very, very committed to the church. My, my in-laws, they're wonderful. And he grew up, you know, in the church, he went through his own journey of changing from this is my parents' faith to now this is my faith, which is a, a beautiful, it's sometimes painful journey, but he went mm -hmm. through that. And uh, right now we were part of some, you know, small groups and we, those are one of the best conversations we have, Daniel and I, when we're just talking about what do you think about this? It's just theological conversations with all the things that we wrestle with, which is a lot. Yeah. We wrestle with so many things. And I think the beauty is not in having a question or a doubt, but in engaging it and just discovering what God shows you. Yeah. And that was going to be my, it, the other question, too. And, and you've kind of already answered it. But the, one of the questions I always like to ask is how about uh, faith challenges or struggles with um, doubt or uh, those kinds of things? Do those creep in at this point in your life or you've just eliminated that based on your commitment to, to God? Oh, no, they get bigger and bigger each second, Rick. Each day, there's more questions, more doubt. Uh, I I think Rick, that because I did not grow up in the church, there is a lot of baggage that I don't have. I do have baggage within the church and Christianity for sure, but I did not grow up in a, in a space or a denomination or a church where you had to believe this or that or else. And so because my encounter with God was so, again, physical, so tangible, for me, my starting point is the God that is real and exists, and, and I cannot deny because I have my x-ray where there were two vertebrae missing in my back, and two weeks later, there's the bones are back. In two weeks, my bones grew back. Wow. And I have the x-ray. And so there's I, I cannot deny God's existence. And once I have that nailed down in my heart, then I can explore any question or any doubt very freely. You know, there's a massive movement about deconstruction. And to me, deconstruction can either be an awful thing when your intent is to destroy something, or it can be the most beautiful thing when what you're seeking is the truth. And the truth is, Jesus is the truth, is the way, he's the, the, the light. 
And so for me, reading, uh, let's say, Romans 12, when it says renew your mind so that you can appreciate, right, the will of God, that's deconstructing to me. Renew whatever's in your head so that you can see a little bit more clearly. Because Paul says we see as if, as if we were looking into a fog mirror. Yeah. yeah and yeah. so, yeah, there's a lot of questions I have. How do you communicate on, a, on an ongoing basis with um, Jesus, with God, God. Uh, through prayer? Um, is that part of it? It is. I go through seasons, Rick. There are seasons in my life when I am journaling like crazy and I journal my conversations with God. Oh. And I, I, I go nuts because I know that God is with me and, and the, the spirit of God speaks to me. So sometimes I write a question for God in my journal and I start writing like whatever comes to my mind. And then later I revisit and I think I have, this does sound like it did not come from me. So I do all these all sorts of experiments. Sometimes I go through seasons like that. Other times I go through seasons where I go on long hikes and it's just no phone, no music, nothing. And I'm just praying, just speaking with God. There are times when I want to intentionally be more about hearing instead of talking. Because some, sometimes we confuse prayer with I'll just talk to God. And I, I'm not saying that is wrong because we're still sharing our, our heart or our thoughts with God. But very few people wait to see if there's something in return if god is saying something to you so sometimes i just read the bible asking god to reveal something to me, and that is my prayer and other times i'm just with friends and i just take a step back and i acknowledge that we're two or three gathered together in the name of god there he is right in the middle in our conversation i experience it as a prayer yeah 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 and there's times when i'm struggling to pray obviously yeah yeah that happens too okay well that's 100 oh, percent. when i'm like talking and i feel like i should be saying something to god or, or when i'm trying to hear from god and there's nothing and and it's the valleys that we all go through and and i'm okay with that because i've got my history with god yeah yeah so it's sometimes i think about it when i'm when i'm struggling to connect with god when i'm struggling to become aware of god's presence around me I just think, you know what, this is this is similar to when I'm sick and I'm I'm longing for those days when I feel okay. Right now, and I'm saying that you're sick, but <laughs> right now it's just a bump and it'll 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 change. Yeah. Well so sometimes I and I go through this and I talk to other folks too who go through it, and that is um is is what I'm thinking, is that coming from God or is yeah. it just coming from my brain because I want it to I want yeah. that, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so it's very sometimes very tough to distinguish when it's God. absolutely you i mean rick you just touched on that is probably the number one question i get asked as a pastor from people when i hear something is this god or is it me by far the most common question I have. And what i say to people is this the question itself is not necessarily wrong but it can be tricky because when we separate them, when we polarize those, it's either God or myself. Then we are saying that it can, that whatever my thought is cannot be God's. And so they're distinct. But ideally, the closer we are to God, ideally, our thoughts should be God's thoughts. And so instead of asking, is it left or right, good or bad, right, right or wrong, instead of saying, is it God or is it me? question that I suggest asking is, is it true? Hmm. <laughs> Whatever is true, right? The truth that comes from God. It can come from, from you. It can come from God. It can come from someone, from a pastor speaking on a Sunday, from, from a passage that you're reading. And if it's true, it's a gift from God. Or something that what you wrote, something that you wrote in a journal, you know, something. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah that's, that's so true too. So, um, are, are we, we always try to keep these to about 40 minutes, and I don't know how we're doing on time here right now, but... We're in Mexican time, Rick. We are good. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Okay. Uh, so so how about, is there, a, is there a, a scripture verse that is like something that you pull out and, and, and live by and use as guidance ongoing, everyday kind of thing? Um, 
Yes and no. There's there's different verses that speak to me at different times and different seasons of my life. If I'm debating something about whether women should preach or not, oh, I'll go to Galatians and there's verses that I'll I'll talk about with fire. But those are not the ones that that necessarily I I live with on a regular basis. One that I can think of is when Jesus talks to his disciples and says. This is how they, how other people, this is how they will know you're my disciples, by the way you love one another. And when we're struggling with politics, when we're struggling with ideology, when we're struggling with anything, how will I show that I'm a disciple if I am loving the person in front of me, if I'm loving the, the group that thinks differently than me? That is a, it's a straightforward kind of i don't know filter line i don't know what to call it yeah yeah, yeah. Great, almost like a rule of life huh. and i appreciate that one Late, these days with with all that's going on in the world that's one that speaks to me and guides me absolutely very cool so now how can we support gabby are you you're um you're uh, there's several um youtube videos available i i look look up your name and and there's a, several that pop up and all of them that i've seen are excellent uh, so there's that any anything else that um we as an audience can do to support you i don't know rick i mean on, i should have a website up <laughs> my husband's been telling me for a long time you know at least you know here's some contact info i'm not good at that but i'll get there <sighs> I don't know. I love participating with with others in whatever God is doing in their communities. And if there's a way I can, you know, join or, or participate or assist, you know, I'd, I'd love to come and be, you know, part of other churches or speaking engagements or you caught me off guard with that question because honestly, I wasn't even thinking that. But okay. good. I'm glad I did because you said I couldn't catch you off guard and I did. So and you just did, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank you so much for taking this time out and to talking with us. And, you know, we just kind of barely touched the surface of who you are and what you do. But um, we have to kind of keep with um, people's commute times and, yeah. uh, you know, with their with their what they're capable of listening to at any one time. So I really appreciate your spending the time with us. I'm, I'm anxious to see more of your stuff online and follow you. And um, I will spread the word about uh, y your ministry as Thank best you, I Frank. can. Thank you so much. I This was awesome. Thank you so much for the invitation. And maybe next time I'll interview you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do have a background in radio after all. <laughs> in Spanish, though, but oh, oh, I, I, I may have problems with it. I took two years of Spanish in high school, so I should be good. Um, <laughs> all right, my friend, thank you so much. God bless you, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again. Thank you, Rick. It was a pleasure. Gabby Viesca's life experience is one that had to be told here on Amazing Greats. As a freelance minister, let's hope that she shows up at a church near you one day. And in the meantime, you can share, she shares her fiery testimony on YouTube videos. You can check it out there. Thanks for sharing your time with us and hearing Gabby's story. Amazing Greats is a voluntary project and graciously edited and produced by Clem Daniels. Please share it with your friends and join us again for another episode of Amazing Greats. Meanwhile, God bless. <laughs>